You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website, gbnews.com. Variety Cruises have been sailing since 1942, and thanks to them, you could set sail in 2025. You have the chance to win a seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With your flights, meals, drinks and excursions included, you can choose from any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. You'll also win an incredible £10,000 in tax-free cash that you can use to make this summer spectacular. We'll also treat you to these luxury travel gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Good evening. We will show you the total solar eclipse live from Mexico within the next hour. Only one in four Muslims in Britain say Hamas were guilty on October the 7th of those atrocities. I find that really quite extraordinary. And William Ragg has been in the news, the victim, apparently, of a honey trap. I will tell you why I do not believe William Ragg to be a victim at all. Frankly, just an idiot and probably quite a dangerous one. But before all of that, let's get the news with Polly Middlehurst. Nigel, thanks very much indeed, and good evening to you. Well, the top story from the GB Newsroom tonight is that West Yorkshire police have confirmed that a nationwide manhunt is now underway for a man wanted in connection with the murder of a woman in Bradford, and they confirmed at a press conference this afternoon the suspect is known to them. 25-year-old Habibur Masoum came to Britain on a student visa and is believed to be from the Oldham area. He's described as an Asian man of slim build. Police want to speak to any taxi drivers in the Bradford area who may have driven the suspect to Bradford Moor Park. He's likely, police say, to have paid in cash. People are also being warned not to approach the suspect. Meanwhile, the killers of 23-year-old footballer Cody Fisher have been jailed for life today with minimum terms to serve of 26 and 25 years, respectively. The semi-professional footballer was stabbed and killed during a fight on the dance floor of a Birmingham nightclub on Boxing Day in 2022. A jury at Birmingham Crown Court found 23-year-old Remy Gordon and 22-year-old Cammy Carpenter guilty of his murder. Cody Fisher's mum, Tracy, said... You never expect your child to be murdered. Well, in other news today, 11 people have been arrested following a pro-Palestine protest at the Labour Party's headquarters. The group, known as Youth Demand, sprayed both the inside and outside of the building in red paint. The protesters are claiming the party are complicit in what they've described as the murder of Palestinians in Israel's conflict with the Hamas terror group. That's after Sakir Starmer reiterated his call just this morning for the government to publish its advice on whether Israel is violating international humanitarian law in Gaza. 
Meanwhile, a new poll has found that 74% of British Muslims would not object if abortion was outlawed. A survey of 1,000 British Muslims carried out by JL Partners also found that just 28% would object if homosexuality was banned. Homosexuality was decriminalised in 1967 and is currently supported by 62% of the general public. The research was commissioned by the Henry Jackson Society, which says the results reveal attitudes are very different from the bulk of the British population. And in the United States, Donald Trump says that a woman's right to abortion should be decided on a state-by-state -state basis. Polls show the majority of Americans believe terminating a pregnancy should be legal, with about one in eight voters saying it's the most important issue for them at the next US election. Well, the former president, who's running again this year, said the overturning of the historic Roe v. Wade ruling actually means choice is returning to the American people. Many states will be different. Many will have a different number of weeks, or some will have more conservative than others, and that's what they will be. At the end of the day, this is all about the will of the people. You must follow your heart or, in many cases, your religion or your faith. Like Ronald Reagan, I am strongly in favor of exceptions for rape, incest, and life of the mother. Donald Trump. For the latest stories, do sign up to GB News Alerts, scan the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Good evening. Well, the last total eclipse here in the UK was back in 1999 as people headed down to Cornwall in vast numbers and Sir Patrick Moore was on the telly. And of course, typically it was wet and windy and cloudy. But these eclipses are phenomenal events and there is one happening right now uh, and it's going up from Mexico through North America. Uh, and we thought we'd show you it live. So I'm joined right now by Dr. David Whitehouse, astronomer and biologist on the sun and the moon. Who better? Uh, David, we're about three minutes away, I think, in Mexico from totality. Yes, we are. This is the moment when, remarkably, the disk of the moon fits precisely over the disk of the sun. And if you think that, that they're so different in distance and they're so different in size, it is a remarkable coincidence that they fit over one another and the moon obscures the bright disk of the sun so we can see the outer atmosphere of sun, the corona. And that's just about to happen down in Mexico. And over the next hour and 45 minutes, that point of totality will move across the United States from the southwest of Mexico to the northeast of, of Canada. And uh, millions of people will be along the 110-mile wide path to, uh, to witness this remarkable yeah. spectacle of nature. And how long does totality itself last? Well, this is quite a long eclipse. Uh, the longest you can possibly get of totality is just over six minutes. This is just over four minutes in most places. So it is actually a very long eclipse. Um, if the weather is cooperating, and I, I hear that there are certain places like Dallas where the weather is not cooperating, you should yeah. get a pretty long view of it. But the important thing to, to mention is that Never look at it with your unaided eye or with a, an optical instrument. Never, ever, in any circumstances, look at the sun that way. You need proper eclipse glasses or you need to view it online. But people, when they have seen an eclipse, it changes lives. It is one of the most, perhaps the most dramatic spectacle of nature we can witness. Yes, it certainly is. And, and does it in literally it. go, does it literally go from light, from day to darkness in minutes? It goes in seconds, actually, because the sun is so bright that even if a tiny sliver of it is still showing through, it, it is very bright. It, it affects the whole, whole landscape. Yeah. But when it is obscured, within seconds, the landscape goes dark. The birds usually think it's nighttime and they stop singing. Uh, and we're looking at the pictures right now, the NASA pictures. This is Mexico right now. Totality in a few seconds, I suspect, David. remaining and when that sliver goes in a few seconds you will then see this this bright um flower this corona atmosphere okay, well, around the sun 
Well, let's keep our eyes on this right now. And uh, there are some times when pictures can do a lot more than words, which, for which I apologise to those listening in their cars. But this is now total darkness in Mexico. And we're waiting to see this corona that David Whitehouse has described. I think the exposure on that camera might be a little tricky, but uh, we should be able to see something in a few moments. OK, well, we'll stick with it. We will stick with it. There we are. There it We're is. Wow. Gosh. There you are. And it's very... The scientists are very interested in the shape of that corona, the shape of the hot outer atmosphere of the sun, because it varies over the sun's 11-year solar cycle. And uh, although we can observe it from space uh, with uh, our own artificial eclipses, if you like, we get the best view when this happens. So there's yeah. a lot of... As well as wonder, there's a lot of science to be done over the next uh, next hour and a half. That is a completely extraordinary picture, and exactly as you described. And the corona seems to be getting bigger and bigger. It is. As, um, as the, if you like, the moon settles in front of the sun, um, and the little bits are, um, are blotted out, you'll see a better picture. But you also see things called Bailey's beads during this time, which is the fact uh -huh. that the edge of the moon has mountains and and valleys, and sometimes yes. the sun will shine through the valleys, and you'll see little beads along the, the edge of the moon. Which we can see, little white beads we can see right now. That's right. That's yeah. right. It's a, it's a beautiful e example of a great cosmic coincidence that this happens. We don't know why. Uh, in the past, the moon was too close to the Earth, uh, and obscure the sun completely in the future, the moon will be too small to do this. For really? some reason, it's just our a few tens of millions of years when we are here. The dinosaurs did not see this type of thing. These, these eclipses are for us. And the next one in our part of the world is going to be 2026, where Majorca or Iceland are recommended, if you want to go and see it. I understand, David, the next UK one is not till 2090, which many of us won't make. I don't think so, but I shall try. <laughs> <laughs> well, all I can say is a big, big thank you thank uh, to you. you for coming on and, and telling us what we were about to witness. And yet, yeah, truly, an astonishing sight. And thank you, David Whitehouse, for that great explanation. Thank you very much indeed. Well, I have to say, folks, I thought that was really worthwhile when he talked about the corona. I really had no idea uh, that it would look as dramatic as that. And so this will now, over the next hour and 45 minutes, make its way right across to New England. Uh, as David said, the weather forecast in Dallas is bad, uh, but it's quite good out on the east coast of America. And many, many millions of people are out there hoping to see this site. I hope you agree that was well worth showing. Very, very dramatic and really quite exciting. Now, on to something uh, that is really rather extraordinarily depressing. Uh, in Bradford, on Saturday afternoon, a woman pushing a baby in a pram through a park was stabbed to death. Mark White, GB News' home and security editor, has an exclusive story on this for us. Mark, what happened and who was the perpetrator? Well, the perpetrator is still at large this evening, someone who is described by the police as being extremely dangerous. The public, for obvious reasons, are being urged not to approach this man, Habibur uh, Masoom, who is a Bangladeshi national who came to the UK two years ago, we've been told, on a student visa. Now, the information that I've been told is that this man uh, was on a course, a degree-level course, which, of course, allows him then on that student visa to remain in the country for around five years normally. I'm told that this man was not an overstayer, uh, so he was still within the terms of this student visa, but he is being hunted at this time for the murder of Kulsuma actor, a 27-year-old mother who was pushing her baby in a pram in the centre of Bradford on Saturday afternoon. She was stabbed multiple times. 
around the neck area. Uh, a local doctor who was off duty, passers-by, rushed to try to help her, but she died a short time later in hospital. Now, police have confirmed that both the victim and the prime suspect in this case were known to each other. Uh, they have not as yet said what the nature of that relationship was, uh, but both the victim and the prime suspect lived in Oldham. There have been police raids taking place throughout today in Oldham, in Chester uh, and in Burnley, where the prime suspect has links to. He was studying at a university in Bedfordshire um, for uh, a course in digital marketing. He was a keen blogger as well, posting uh, various videos on the internet of himself. Well, now this man has gone to ground. The last time he was seen, Nigel, was about uh, 3.40 in the afternoon on Saturday, some 20 minutes after this attack, uh, and he has not been seen since. Now, the Home Office, incidentally, have issued a statement, they say, with regard uh, to the man's immigration status. It would be inappropriate to comment, given the live investigation. However, they've said where foreign nationals are involved and then ultimately convicted of serious offences, then they will face the full weight of the law and they will face deportation at the earliest possible opportunity. Yes, well, we'll see about that. Mark White, thank you for giving us that ugly, grisly story. Uh, and we'll see, as and when they catch this man, whether he is actually deported. I rather doubt that will happen. In a moment, there was some polling out over the weekend that should, in my opinion, have led every front page of the newspapers today. Should have been the major debate on all the broadcast channels, and yet they don't want to talk about it. This is a survey, a scientific survey, of British Muslims, and it asks them their attitudes towards Hamas, their attitudes towards many, many questions in society, and it tells us how many of them think this country should introduce Sharia law. It genuinely is shocking. All of that in a couple of minutes. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday. Are our relationships with foreign countries actually undermining free speech on a day-to-day -day basis in our universities? Well, it's very good to be with you. It's difficult to form a, a kind of clear conclusion because, as we know, universities are much, much more reliant on international fees than they used to be. We are seeing some sort of troubling developments, particularly at the level of admissions criteria. We're seeing quite stark and, frankly, scandalous disparities in the admissions criteria for domestic students as against foreign students in some universities. And so part of the problem is that the financial incentive structures um, are such that uh, universities risk becoming more and more dependent upon foreign regimes um, because they're simply bringing in an awful lot more money. Um, uh, James, fees... of course, this, this, uh, all of this discussion, we say countries, countries, countries. Uh, frankly, mainly, we're really looking at one country, aren't we? China. Well, China is certainly a, a, a focus. I mean, nearly one in three undergraduate students uh, from overseas at Russell Group universities are from, were from China in 2021. 60% of overseas postgraduates uh, come from China. Uh, we know from uh, the FBI and the Five Eyes security chiefs that um, China is a, a master at intellectual property theft. Uh, and of course, there's a whole range of human rights issue concerns over Taiwan, Tibet, Uyghur Muslims, uh, lockdown tyranny. I mean, all of these are issues about which you know researchers and academics should be free to teach. Uh, and question and in universities where there is a heavily heavy commercial reliance uh, on regimes uh, like China, there are obvious uh, wow. disincentives to uh, uh, ensuring that academics and, and students are free to speak their mind on those issues. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. 
That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens. With our team of dedicated journalists across the UK, GB News brings you accurate reporting of the day's topical agenda. When the news breaks, wherever and whenever it's happening, we'll be there. This is GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Ever since the 7th of October, we've seen these pro-Palestinian marches taking place in London and elsewhere. Indeed, I drove through one on Friday evening in Parliament Square and was very pleased with the fact that I was in a blacked-out car, windows-wise, uh, because I've been deeply critical. You know, we've got people living inside our country that believe in a totally different set of values and priorities. But I was assured by everybody, don't worry. It's only a minority. And after all, on these marches, we see an awful lot of white British Christians. And I kind of wanted to believe it until a poll published this weekend, conducted for the Henry Jackson Society, but done by the reputable JL Partners, has come out with these facts. This is a survey of British Muslims, remember. Only 25% believe that Hamas committed murder and rape. Well, we've all seen the pictures of what happened, the... the um, heli gliders that came in to that festival, but only 25% of British Muslims are prepared to accept that it actually happened. Nearly half, 46%, sympathise with Hamas. Hang on, Hamas is a terrorist organisation, a prescribed organisation by the British government, seen to be not just an enemy to Israel, but potentially an enemy to us, and yet nearly half of British Muslims support it, or at least sympathise with it with it. 52% of British Muslims want it to be illegal to show an image of Muhammad the Prophet. Well, you know, in our country, we do cartoons of the Archbishop of Canterbury, we do cartoons of the Pope and anybody in religion. It's certainly up to their image being portrayed and often in a less than favourable light. And the one that really I thought was perhaps most worrying of all, that 32% of British Muslims want to see Sharia law implemented in the UK. I find this genuinely terrifying. And I say that because the Muslim population of Britain is 4 million today. By 2050, it's projected to be over 10 million. Are we to have a huge group of millions of people living in our midst that, don't, that not only don't share our values, but in many ways would like to impose their values on us? That's what I'm disturbed by. Well, I'm joined by Dr. Alan Mendoza, founder and, of course, Executive Director of the Henry Jackson Society, who conducted the poll. And I'm chair joined by Mohammed Amin, former chairman of the Conservative Muslim Forum. Um, Alan, you commissioned this poll. Were you surprised by the results? In some senses, yes. In some senses, no. I mean, clearly, what, I, what we ought to be looking at is the totality of what we're seeing. And the totality of what we're seeing is that there is clearly an extremism problem within this subset of people in the UK. It's writ large across the board. It is, you know, question after question after question. It is quite different to the control poll of the general population. Uh, and even if you can quibble about certain bits and say, well, you know, people didn't know what they were answering, the fact is that overall, it's showing a much larger level of extremism uh, amongst the British Muslim communities than the general population. I think that's right. And, Mohammed, you know, you've been on this show before and we're always very pleased to have you. And we have, we have Muslim priests that come on this show and we argue these points and, you know, you always condemn the acts of extremists within the Muslim community. You always do. Um, and that's quite right. It does need to be called out, just as, you know, any acts of extremism within any community yeah. in a democracy should be called out. And the point I made at the top there was that I've wanted to believe that it's a minority of the British Muslim population that support these views. Because all the Muslims I know want to get on with their lives and do well and don't go on these demonstrations. But, Mohammed, these figures indicate that half the Muslim population have an entirely different set of priorities and values to that what we would call British. Well, it's a big survey. I downloaded the tables yep. uh, this afternoon and I've been looking at them. And some of the things are pretty discouraging. Others, you wonder what people think about the polls. For example, 
9% of the total British population want Sharia law in this country. What do they mean by that? Well, 9% of the British population would be, I, I, I'm going to have a guess here, but most of them would be of the Muslim faith. Uh, only 6.5% of them is the Muslim faith. All right, so there's a, a tiny 2%, yep. a tiny 2% yeah, but, but, but want Sharia that, law. But what were they th thinking about? And for that matter, what do the Muslims themselves actually mean? Well, when remember they say that, they that with Sharia all polling, law? There yeah. is a margin of error yeah. of 2 or 3%. Yeah. People misunderstand the question. So yeah. I'm not going to take that too seriously. Yeah. But uh, the word you just used, discouraging, yeah. I, I wouldn't use that word. Yeah. I would say alarming. Uh, when I look at this country and what British Muslims are doing, the careers they're pursuing, their public-spirited attitude, I find it discouraging that we're getting answers like this from the poll, but... I do not panic when I look at this poll. I am discouraged by certain aspects of okay. it, particularly, for example, people are in denial about Hamas and its murders. On in October Israel. the 7th? Yep. Yeah. I, I, Mohammed is, you know, as he always does, using very moderate mm. language, never wanting to inflame any debate, but it's much worse than discouraging, isn't it? Yeah, look, I, I sympathise in Mohammed's point of view. He, yeah. he uh, would not agree with these views quite clearly, and I'm sure he's as, you know, struggling to understand it as much as everyone else. But it is worrying, it's deeply worrying, that there are some people who are not like Mohammed, who uh, have a very different viewpoint quite clearly. And what's particularly worrying, Nigel, is if you, if you dissect the results, on almost every different point, the youngest cohort is much more radical than others, and perhaps that's a generalised societal problem, um, but it's a large cohort, obviously, given the way the population pyramid is working. And the other fascinating and terrifying thing is that graduates are much more radical than non-graduates. Mm -hmm. So it seems that having a university education is no bar, and in fact, in some ways, appears to be a gateway to more radical views. Mm -hmm. Well, I was a Trotskyist at 20. Yeah, I mean, that is a fair point. Yeah. You know, a lot of people have opinions at university that change. Yeah. But I also think Alan's point here really is these figures are across the board and that's what makes them very, very surprising. Yes, there's a preponderance in youth, but it does go right through the ages, doesn't it? Correct. And when we say graduates, we don't mean necessarily people who are 21. We mean anyone who's graduated from right. uh, university at any given point. So that could be, you know, someone in yeah. their 70s now. No, I'm, I'm beginning to understand, folks, why the police just stand there and do nothing. I'm beginning to understand why the police are terrified. They clearly understand the sheer size and scale of the problem. But the really big question to both of you is what do we do now? Well, that is the question. And I think the, this is a challenge of integration policy in this country. It is certainly true that many of Britain's Muslims have integrated beautifully and are, and are you know, kind of playing valuable roles in society. But it is quite clear from this and other polls, this is not the only poll in, uh, in recent years that's shown this. But, it's, is, but it's the starkest. It, it is the starkest, which yep. tells you that things may have gotten worse, yep. which tells you integration yep. policy may not be working in the way intended. So what has to happen straight away, in my view, is the government dusts off all those reviews that have been gathering um, you know, kind of dust on the shelves, the Casey review, the Khan review, the Shawcross review, and implement them straight away and go, we've had studies into this problem. We understand what the issues are, how we can move this forward. Let's get on and actually do it rather than talking about it. And I put it to you, Mohammed, that it's going to be very difficult to integrate or perhaps even reintegrate people whose views are as hardline as this. And there may be a couple of million of them. On the contrary, British Muslims have been getting more integrated with every decade that's gone by. First of all, geographical dispersion, because at one time they used to be very concentrated in certain parts of the country, like Trample Tower Hamlets. Uh. People from Tower Hamlets have been moving out into the countryside. Uh, it's quite clear with every year that goes by, people are more dispersed, more people are living alongside people who are not Muslims. and. There's been massive progression inside the media, in the professions, in the law, amongst banking. I see a very positive success story of integration. Well, that may well be true for a large number of Muslim people who've done well at school, who are doing well professionally, and you're quite right. There are lots of Muslim people doing incredibly well. My worry isn't them. My worry is that if this poll is right, up to two million, uh, you know, who, who, and some will be in good jobs, but I bet a lot are at the poorest end of society. I don't know how the 
answers to these questions vary by people's uh, socioeconomic group. I don't know if the data tables have that in, but if they do, I haven't had time to look at them in detail. Uh, what I think is a real issue is that there are still parts of the country where Muslims are sort of quite concentrated geographically, yeah. and that dispersion needs to continue. Does it also depend a little bit on where they came from originally, whether the families are Tunisian or, say, Pakistani? I suspect not very much. I mean, attitudes towards the Israel-Palestine conflict may well vary by geography because, of course, yeah. everybody's Proximity Muslim, and, yeah. but it, it, it makes a big difference, if, well, if you, the most extreme, if you're Palestinian, for example, as opposed to if you came from the Indian subcontinent or Malaysia. Alan, I've been told many, many times, and seen myself, that there are areas in the north of England where communities that have come from Pakistan have not advanced very well. Is that part of this problem? Well, I think part of the problem is just this lack of integration in those places. So, um, uh, someone like Ed Hussain wrote about this in, in a book oh. where he you know, went around the country essentially pointing out to what he termed a monoculture, which he did mean a Pakistani monoculture, which he of course understands well coming from a similar yeah. background, uh, which has taken over from the British culture. So, from his perspective, and I think Mohammed's saying the same thing here, it's about, you know, we've got to break down that area. And that is what things like the Case Review wanted to do. It suggested you've got to break areas down so that people do have access to other people in this country and understand they are not islands and that they are part of a broader whole. OK, well, folks, thank you. And discouraging, alarming, you make your own minds up at home. But let's hope that government and civil society do act because we cannot afford for this problem to fester and grow. Now, the news broke on Thursday night that Conservative Member of Parliament for Hazelgrave, William Ragg, had been caught in a honey trap sting. The thing that absolutely stunned me was the support, the almost wall-to-wall -wall support that he got from Conservative Members of Parliament, the Charles of the Exchequer called him courageous. Personally, I think he's an idiot, and perhaps a very dangerous idiot, but I'll debate that in a moment with Bob Seeley MP, one of those that defended him. Good evening. Here's your latest GB News weather brought to you by the Met Office. Most of us will see some heavy rain and some strong winds as we go through tonight into tomorrow in association with a relatively deep area of low pressure. Now, this feature has been named by Meteo France because it's going to bring some impactful weather there. In the UK, it's not so stormy, but nonetheless, there'll be some strong winds, particularly around coastal parts and also a spell of heavy rain feeding in across parts of northern England and across Scotland as we go through the early hours of Tuesday. Because of the blustery, wet and cloudy weather, temperatures for many of us aren't going to drop much. Most places holding up in the mid to high single figures. So a relatively mild start tomorrow morning, but quite a cloudy and a wet one and a windy start for most of us. The heaviest rain will be across eastern parts of Scotland, could cause some problems, particularly on the roads. Also some heavy rain for northern England, but all of this does gradually clear away towards the northeast with something a bit drier following in behind, but also a scattering of showers. Now temperatures will be down several degrees compared to today, highs of just 13, perhaps even 14 Celsius towards the southeast. A chilly but bright start for many of us on Wednesday. However, the fine weather doesn't last. More wet weather is going to push its way in from the west and we're going to see wind strengthening again. And again, that rain could cause some problems, particularly over southwestern parts of Scotland. At the moment, Thursday looks like a drier day for many of us, and that drier theme looks like it will continue into Friday across the south before more rain arrives further north. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria De Piero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister. And we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. I'm Patrick Christie's. Every weeknight from nine, I bring you two hours of unmissable, explosive debate and headline-grabbing interviews. What impact has that had? We got death threats and the bomb threat and so on. Our job is to do what's in the best interest of our country. You made my argument for me. My guests and I tackle the issues that really matter with a sharp take on every story. I'm hearing it up and down the country. That was a beginning, not an end. Patrick Christie's tonight from 9pm only on GB News, Britain's news channel.
Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. This is all about standards in public life. MPs have to hold themselves to a higher standard than all the rest of us. Now, look, we are all capable of stupidity. We're all pot potentially victims of flattery. But if a member of parliament sends compromising photographs of his person to somebody who is not quite sure who they are, that is an act of idiocy. Idiocy. Not on its own, perhaps, a sackable offence. But what is a sackable offence, I think, is to give the private telephone numbers of public figures to somebody you already know to be a bad actor. And what astonished me was everybody was coming out supporting him, and I wondered why. Is it the Conservatives fear a by-election? Is it actually because he's gay? Because I tell you what, had this been a late, middle-aged, heterosexual man who sent images of himself to a young girl, one over 16 or 18, but, I, but, you know, I reckon he'd have lost the whip already. So I've been pondering what the hell is going on. Well, finally, someone's broken ranks. Andrew Jenkins, Member of Parliament for the Tories, has said that, you know, I too received a WhatsApp message and reported it. It was worded identically, mentioning conference. Unlike some MPs, I'm not happy with RAG. As a mother with a young child who only recently had threats, it's unforgivable of him to compromise the security of fellow MPs. Action is needed. I agree. The police have announced today there is an investigation. They ought to call RAG in, but not to give him victim counselling, to find out the truth of how many telephone numbers he's given out and what other information about British politics or the running of Parliament he's given out. Now, Bob Seeley and I often agree on things. We sometimes disagree on things. Yes. Conservative Member of Parliament for the Isle of Wight. Bob, you went on Newsnight and said, for him to stand up and say, I'm sorry, I was weak, mm -hmm. takes a strong man. He might have given your number over, for all you know. Uh, I'm sort of hoping he hasn't, to be well, honest. Well, but... that's not good enough, is it? Come on! <laughs> no, OK. Look, look, I, am I happy with it? No, and I think it's pretty foolish actions, Nigel. I completely agree with that. Uh, my, my principle here is that if... I, I just... If somebody's being blackmailed, the sooner they come out and say, I'm being blackmailed, the better. And I would rather forgive him in order to encourage him and others that if they're in a similar situation and if they do stupid things, yeah. to stop doing stupid things. So, and he's not... Going, there's not going to be a by-election here. He, he could well, lose you, the whip. Well, you don't he could want lose, there to be a by-election. No, but he could... Even if he lost the whip, uh, I think well, he'd probably fail. I mean, first, firstly... For Jeremy Hunt to call him courageous... Courageous is taking on a mugger in the street, mm -hmm. not betraying your colleagues. Yes, you're right, but at the same time, if you've been done something stupid, it actually takes a reasonably brave person to think, OK, I have done something stupid, I now need to fess up. Well, maybe up. it was about to go and public and he had no choice. I, I don't know, Nigel, but potentially, but I, I would rather be on the whole sort of forgiveness is divine. You, you know, you might say there's a bit too much forgiveness in places in our society. I, I would rather, if somebody's being blackmailed, I would rather them no. go public with this ASAP so they're not, they're not... there's less damage to other people. I'm not a hypocrite, Bob. I haven't lived a blameless life. None of us do. Yeah. And we all do silly things and From make mistakes. But I've never, ever given out private telephone numbers of anybody, uh, even to the press yeah. who ask questions, let alone to somebody who I already knew was a seriously bad person. What do we know? But, by the way, sorry, do yeah. we think this person was just a lone individual? Or is this some well, sort of Russian front? It's or very is this... interesting. I mean, you speculated whether, you know, could it be Russia, could it mm -hmm. be China, uh, could it be, you know, a scurrilous news website? Mm -hmm. In the case of RAG, it doesn't actually matter. No. But on the broader picture, we need to know. Yeah, I mean, look, the broader picture, it does matter, because the, it, this doesn't look like the Chinese, because they're a bit more sophisticated, they lure people in over time, there's more economic incentives. Yeah. The Russians sometimes do things just really crudely, almost to be in that sort of Cold War-style spy game, rather sort of foolishly, so it's not so much if they get caught. If they, if they get away with it, yeah. fine, but actually if they're just doing some damage, it makes them feel good, because it makes them feel like they're back in the yeah. Soviet Union, etc. Because it's, it's been... It's MPs 
but I know at least one Sunday Times journalist, at least mm -hmm. one senior BBC correspondent. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's been very much a Westminster Village thing. Yeah, but look, I mean, I'm sad to say, Nigel, this is just this is the, the future happening now. The, the I've been made aware that the Chinese were looking at my own. Yeah my yeah. own office a couple of years ago. I, I mean, I can't remember, but I think I got a text saying, nice to meet you at a conference, and I thought well, I wasn't at a conference. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't send any sort of uh, incriminating photos. Really? I, I was oh, we're very pleased to hear that. <laughs> Is uh, Westminster full of an awful lot of very sad, lonely people? Um, I sort of hope not. I don't know. I mean, it's quite a sociable place at times. Uh, politics can be quite a lonely profession. It can and be. so can any profession. Right. It, it depends. I mean, I think... There's a reasonable amount of camaraderie, and I think for Nigel, uh, sorry, for, for William, there is a certain amount of there, but for the grace of God. I hope I would never be dumb enough to send uh, incriminating pictures. Sure. And I have a very strict rule of actually doing you that if you're in a I'm... relationship or not, you, you, because you never know where they're going to end up. But it's the phone numbers that matter. Now, yeah. Angela Rayner. Yeah. Sir Keir Starmer today has said he hasn't looked at the evidence. Breathtaking. Uh, because, you know, he's been reliably informed it's all OK. Yeah. The Mail on Sunday yesterday came up with a, a new twist to the story. It was yeah. tweets of herself in what really was her home, yeah. as opposed to what she said was her mm -hmm. home. Uh, the Labour Party are out mm -hmm. in force. They're surrogates saying nothing to see here. What say you? Um, I, I think, for me, it, if... This is the problem. This has got Ed Davey and Angela Rayner. They're both the same. They are demanding resignations from other people all the time. They're demanding the highest of standards. Fair enough. And yet they don't seem to be applying it to themselves. And when you have David Lammy, uh, potentially the next Foreign Secretary, yep. going on TV yesterday saying there is a difference between government and a Labour Party which may or may not be on the edge, verge of government, you've got to think there is an extraordinary level of double standards yeah. here. And I think it just, again, it makes the political classes look collectively bad, that if I'm shouting at you, why aren't you perfect, and then I find myself yeah. to have feet yeah. of clay. And, I mean, you know, the amount of capital gains tax is relatively small, and we know all those things, yeah. but it does appear... Actually, I put it to you, Bob, really, yeah. you know, just in the last week, the last month, the last year, the last... certainly since 2019, actually, standards in public life the general, most members of the public would say their standards have fallen. I really hope they're not. And, and actually, people getting caught out doing the wrong thing actually could say could, it could be that the system is working. I think there's a problem for... Um, I think there's a problem now in the Labour Party yeah. because the Labour Party is saying the standards that we hold other people to are not the standards okay. that we're going to apply to ourselves. Bob City, a major point. Now, a Labour spokesman says Angela and her husband mutually decided to maintain their existing residences to reflect their family circumstances, and they shared child care responsibilities. Angela has always made clear she also spent time at her husband's property when they had children and got married. She was perfectly entitled to do so. Gosh, it must have been very confusing for those young children, but hey. Now, the What the Farage moment is Zara Salim. She was one of the women that organised the Black Lives Matter march that went to the docks at Bristol that tore down the Colston statue and put it into the dock. And she, this wonderful Black Lives Matter organisation that everybody was saying how marvellous they are, apart from people like me who got sacked for telling the truth, she has embezzled, it now turns out, up to £70,000 of money that was going to Black Lives Matter, and while she has received a prison sentence, quite rightly, she's now been asked to pay compensation of £1. £1! You nick £70,000 and you're asked to repay a pound. They do say that there could be, in future, the ability to take money off her if she makes some. But uh, I've got to tell you, that sends out to me a very, very bad, very negative message. And by the way, it wasn't just happening here. In America as well, those running Black Lives Matter seem to finish up living in mansions. And it was never folks from the start. Never, ever about racial equality. It was actually about fostering division for individual personal benefit. A dreadful, truly dreadful organisation. Now, in a moment, we're going to talk honour killings because there's been a 60% increase in honour killings. Some are blaming the backlog in the courts. Uh, but is the truth of it that we have an increasingly radicalised population here who think behaving like this in Great Britain in 2024 is somehow acceptable? News break.
Breakfast, every day from 6am. TfL bosses have come under fire after banning an advert... Oh, God. <laughs> they banned an advert for a comedy show because it had a hot dog on it, because that supposedly promotes obesity. The comedian Ed Gamble has swapped the image of the fast food favourite in favour of a cucumber instead. And there's the cucumber on the plate. So, is the UK turning into a nanny state? Let's talk to former presenter of Fat Families, Steve Miller, and nutritionist Olivia Parry. Good to see you both this morning. Olivia, it's a comedy show. Um, he's not promoting eating hot dogs, is he? Is this just a load of nonsense? The thing is, we have a huge problem with overweight and obesity in this country. We're fourth in Europe. Um, it's big business. Advertising for food companies is big business. They make, you know, they make so much money. You just have to switch on primetime TV to watch, you know, food after food advertisements. And we, it, it's for the youngsters as well who don't have the nutritional education. We're not taught cookery in school anymore. People go to go to college and to university. They don't know how to cook. But and it leads forgive me, to, forgive like, me for jumping in, Olivia. Know. Forgive me for jumping in. But the, but the, the whole point with this is it's an advert for a comedy show. Yes, I know. But this is a this is a wider issue. I think it's a load of old tosh. To be quite honest with you. It's a hot dog. In fact, I wish they'd have put onions on the hot dog. A bit of what you fancy won't hurt you. You should eat 80 20 anyway. You know, we talk about a nanny state. I actually think, arguably, we're becoming an authoritarian state. Opinions banned. Comedy banned. The England flag banned. It's like we've got to wear a virtual muzzle. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Honour crimes have risen radically in this country. This is marriage, rape, death threats, assault, and in the most extreme cases, of course, it is murder too. This is a problem... Well, I'd never heard of it until a few years ago, but it's a problem particularly to do with those that live in our country and come from South Asia. But the really alarming thing is that data that's been studied from 26 out of 39 constabularies is telling us that year on year... There's been a 60% increase in honour abuse. Now, I've been sort of scratching my head and wondering, why on earth would that be? Would it be that certain sections of our community have become more radicalised, particularly since the 7th of October? That, I thought, perhaps was a viable explanation, but many are saying no. It is actually because the criminal justice system is clogged up and so far behind... Uh, that actually it's allowing people who should be brought to justice to go on perpetrating crimes. Well, I have to be honest with you, I don't know the truth of this at all. Let's speak to Yasmin Khan, director of the Halo Project, a charity that supports the victims of forced marriage and honour-based violence. Yasmin, good evening, welcome to the programme. Uh, how big, how serious... You know, we know generally... There are massive backlogs in the criminal justice system. Do you really think that is having a major effect on this huge 60% increase in these offences? I'm not hearing her. Ah, we have a bit of problem there with Yasmin's audio. We're going to retest, and I hope 
get it back very, very soon indeed. Either way, either way, whether it is increased radicalisation, whether it is a backlog in the criminal justice system, it is truly shocking. And, you know, it's a little bit like the story that we covered earlier on of the polling that was done by JL Partners for the Henry Jackson Society. Ever since Tony Blair came to power, surrounded by his friends, Alistair Campbell and Peter Mandelson, they said they were going to change this country. They were going to rub the noses of the right in diversity. And yes, that's the word, diversity. The encouragement of multiculturalism. State money being spent to encourage separate communities to exist in our cities. No one thinking that perhaps integration and some shared common values might be the kind of diversity that would work. I've never heard Blair, I've never heard Campbell, I've never heard Mandelson apologise for what their vision of diversity has led to. But you might have thought, come 2010 and 14 years of Conservative government, that some of this would have changed. But no, the truth is, actually, they themselves have generally been terrified of these issues and the whole thing, frankly, has just got worse and worse. I think the British public actually are waking up to this in the most extraordinary way. But I'm not sure that Westminster is. There are some that are brave and stand up, but there are many now genuinely fearful. And after those appalling scenes that we saw in Parliament Square the day that MPs were supposed to vote on that SP motion, I'm perhaps not surprised. I'm not going to get Yasmin Khan back, I don't think, which is all a bit sad. And I could just sit here and chat to you for hours. But I've got Jacob here with me. Uh, Jacob, do you take my point that diversity, yeah, different people, different backgrounds, different religions, um, different ancestral links, but provided they're in the country and integrated and we have some shared common values, that form of diversity can be rather jolly. Oh, yeah, I agree with you in, in, entirely. I, I think that... Um, the crucial thing is that once you've become a British citizen, you view yourself as being a British citizen, yeah. and everybody likewise views you as being a British citizen. And that winning of a passport is fundamental, and we are all equal under the law. What's happened with legislation is that it's changed it. It's shifted the balance, so some are more equal than others. And that was a very deliberate, as you rightly pointed out, Blairite yeah. construct. It was very cleverly done, very politically powerful. And the Conservatives... I've been very nervous about dealing with it because our history on it wasn't so good. Now, if you go back to the um, by-election in 1964, uh, uh, when the Labour foreign minister had to stand again, and how did the Conservatives run that? What was our slogan yeah, in that election? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A really disgraceful yeah, yeah, slogan yeah, yeah, yeah. that neither of us... We better not repeat. Indeed, but, uh, yeah, indeed. Yeah. That's right. And then Enoch Powell's speech. Yeah. Enoch Powell's speech is worth reading because it contextualises why an immigrant community was suspicious of conservatism. And then, of course, we're actually effective about migration, or at least we were when Margaret Thatcher was around. And so you have a view that the Tories aren't keen on immigrants. And so when we start saying you must integrate, people think that's coming from a position of antagonism rather than of generosity. And we need to turn that round so it's clear that it's from generosity rather than antagonism. I, I take that long-term historical point. And much as I, you know, thought Powell was an astonishing figure... Oh, he was, but his 1968 speech is awful. It, well, it, it actually made it more difficult to talk about the subject... Absolutely right, ..than yes. easy, and that was the fundamental problem with it. But in the course of the last 14 years... Radicalisation has grown hugely. This particular report that I'm reading now about honour crimes has risen hugely. The size, and I know this problem is South Asian and not confined to one religion, but let's be frank, the size of the Muslim population has now reached 4 million. It is projected to be over 10 million by 2050. I'm not so sure the Conservatives as yet have lifted a finger to try and deal with this. No, no, and I, th I think that's right. I think the history explains why we've been cautious, but the problem is now more serious. And we are now disadvantaging other British citizens, that, that some British women have lesser rights because of the communities right. that they are in. Um, they may be affected by different laws, even, that they find that they are following. And if you look at the history of 
the development of our laws, we increasingly protect people and protect them under a single law which we're all equal under. And instead, we've allowed multiculturalism to recognise that other behaviours well, can be equally valid. And that, I think, has been a mistake. This was the other debate we had tonight linked to that last item was the Henry Jackson Society poll. You know, if 46% of British Muslims either fully support or have strong sympathy with Hamas, a prescribed terrorist organisation, we have a problem. Th this is really interesting because John Locke, former constituent, I'm <laughs> proud to say... A um, long time ago. A long time ago, but uh, uh, from North East Somerset, um, made the point that you accept, as a matter of tolerance, other people's religions, yep. but that doesn't allow them to break your law. So if you have a religion that believes in human sacrifice, yeah. human sacrifice is breaking your law, so you don't allow the human sacrifice, but they're entitled to believe that it's a good thing. You don't challenge their belief, but you make them obey the ordinary law. And I think in modern society, we have conflated the idea of tolerance with what people believe with saying, well, if you believe that, then you can go ahead and do whatever you like. And that's the bit that's mistaken, and we need to rebuild the argument for saying the ordinary law must apply to everybody. And what do we do about this? I mean, how, you know, the police have watched these demos, hands off. Now I see these polling numbers, I begin to understand why. The scale of the problem is enormous. Yes, but the scale of the problem is enormous if you don't do anything about it. Yeah. You, you have to um, look at the most extreme cases and you have to try and deal with those and you can begin to persuade people, but also protecting people. You know, the, the, the issue you raised about honour killings, yeah. if you are protecting women from this risk, you will find that they bring their children up in the next generation to think that honour killings are not such a good idea. Well, I hope that's right. And maybe the criminal justice system being clogged up is a part of this problem. But, of course, that's the price of lockdown that we're still paying, isn't it? Well, partly, and partly, I think, an awful lot of special pleading in a criminal justice system that's pretty idle. Uh, that, that, you know, look at the hours they work, look at the holidays that they have. Uh, I'm not that sympathetic. Jacob, as ever, the slave master, if you work in the public services, <laughs> Jacob doesn't think you should work from home three days a week. By modern standards, he probably is a slave master. Now, Jacob, <laughs> you're, you're chosen. Well, you're absolutely discussing? Right. well, this very important uh, intervention in the sun by West Streeting on the NHS. Yeah. I think this is so important. Yeah. We can talk about the NHS now on the right of politics because West Streeting has given an essentially Tory view of reform. So Tory, the Tories haven't dared to say it. And I think that's really interesting, important, and he's becoming, uh, I think, a really serious political figure. I quite rate him, I have to say, and he's a thinker. He's gone way outside the box with this because at every general election since only 48, Labour say we created it. And he's referred to middle class lefties, which is the language you and I use. It's, uh, it's as you it come from a Labour MP, front bench spokesman is really powerful. Does he mean it or is it triangulation, electoral manoeuvre? I think he means it. I, I, I genuinely oh, believe he fascinating. means it. Fascinating. Well, there you are. You heard it here first. Jacob Rees Mogg is a fan of some figures of the modern British Labour Party. Well, if they do the right thing, he would be. Alex Burkill, give us the weather. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Good evening. Here's your latest GB News weather brought to you by the Met Office. Most of us will see some heavy rain and some strong winds as we go through tonight into tomorrow in association with a relatively deep area of low pressure. Now, this feature has been named by Meteo France because it's going to bring some impactful weather there. In the UK, it's not so stormy, but nonetheless, there'll be some strong winds, particularly around coastal parts, and also a spell of heavy rain feeding in across parts of northern England and across Scotland as we go through the early hours of Tuesday. Because of the blustery, wet and cloudy weather, temperatures for many of us aren't going to drop much. Most places holding up in the mid to high single figures. So a relatively mild start tomorrow morning, but quite a cloudy and a wet one and a windy start for most of us. The heaviest rain will be across eastern parts of Scotland, could cause some problems, particularly on the roads. Also some heavy rain for northern England, but all of this does gradually clear away towards the northeast with something a bit drier following in behind, but also a scattering of showers. Now temperatures will be down several 
degrees compared to today. Highs of just 13, perhaps even 14 Celsius towards the southeast. A chilly but bright start for many of us on Wednesday. However, the fine weather doesn't last. More wet weather is going to push its way in from the west and we're going to see wind strengthening again. And again, that rain could cause some problems, particularly over southwestern parts of Scotland. At the moment, Thursday looks like a drier day for many of us and that drier theme looks like it will continue into Friday across the south before more rain arrives further north. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. This is your chance to win our biggest prize of the year so far. First, there's a totally tax-free £10,000 in cash for you to spend this summer. Then we want to send you on a bespoke seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. Thanks to Variety Cruises, you'll be able to choose from any of their 2025 Greek adventures and discover Greece like never before. And with flights, meals, drinks and excursions included, all you have to do is relax. We'll also give you these terrific travel treats for another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04 PO Box 8690 Derby DE19 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech.